Welcome everyone to Money Show's Accredited Investors Virtual Expo and our next presentation. My name is Natasha and I'm your host. I am pleased to introduce Mr. Louis Navalier, who is one of Wall Street's renowned growth investment advisors. He is the founder and chairman of Navalier & Associates, a premier money management firm. Today, Mr. Navalier will be discussing the seasonally strong time of year that has arrived. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Navalier. We look forward to your presentation. Well, it's an honor to be here. Well, it's, it is a happy time of year. The next several months should be very, very strong for the market, especially through January. But uh, if history repeats, we're going to be strong through April. So why don't I just jump in and give you the reasons why? Uh, well, let's uh, first look at um, what the, the Dow has done in the last 20 years, 50 years, and 100 years. And as you can see, October is a seasonally strong month especially in the last 20 years. Now, that surprises a lot of people because you know there was an October 87 where it didn't do so good, but that was well over 20 years ago. And, uh, and uh, even though we had an October 87, it didn't uh, ding the returns in the last 50 or 100 years. So um, October's a good month. We're off to a great start this earnings announcement season, and I expect the good earnings to continue for the remainder of this month. Uh, as you might notice, November is a seasonally stronger time of year. Um, in November, we often get an early January effect, which is a small cap rally. Um, I think the main reason November uh, does well is it's a happy time of year. You know, we, this is when we gather with family and friends for Thanksgiving, uh, whether it's uh, for food and football and all that's good stuff. And uh, when we're happy, markets are happy, and that seems to rub off. There's also a lot of year-end pension funding that goes on. Uh, between Thanksgiving and the end of the year, and December's uh, pretty good too. Uh, I really like January, although uh, this chart is showing you January's down the last 20 years, but I really like January because we get new pension funding. We get another round of earnings. Uh, I'm somebody that really, really craves earnings. And then uh, it can get a little bumpy in, in, in February and March, but they are up months on average, but the real strong month is April. And a lot of that's just pension funding. You know, people, we all have to fund our pensions by April 15th. And then it gets bumpy until July. And uh, so that's the ride we're on, but the next four months should be outstanding. Okay, uh, one of the reasons we're so excited is uh, when we look at forward earnings, um, which are uh, in blue and revenues, forward revenues in red, they are continuing to climb. Now, we are in a very severe inflationary environment, okay? And so essentially what that means is companies have to raise their prices. And uh, so that's naturally gonna boost revenues, okay? Um, we do have a, an economic recovery underway here in America, even though China and some other countries have stalled here recently. And, um, and the earnings are growing fast in revenues due to margin expansion. In fact, a lot of our earnings surprises come from margin expansion. So I want you to hang on, enjoy the ride, but um, this, this also is, is a good force underneath the stock market, sunny and higher. Now, as far as earnings surprises go, uh, they're in green. And you can see uh, 60, 70% earnings surprises are common. In some recent quarters, we were over 80%. And then below we have earnings disappointments and, um, and uh, there were over 20% earnings disappointments last quarter. But uh, by and large, um, we expect to have a lot more positive earnings than negative earnings. And, uh, and of course, guidance is going to be crucial. Uh, but this is just another force that should drive the stock and propel the stock market higher. OK, as far as uh, 2021 is concerned, uh, we sh this should be the record year for uh, revenue growth. Uh, we're looking at 14.9% revenue growth. And next year, we're looking at, at about 7%. Okay. And there's a chart here in the, in the lower left hand corner that kind of shows you the annualized numbers. And, um, but, but you can, but uh, it shows how the revenue growth as uh, expectations have changed. But, um, you know, we're going to continue to grow well in the next year. And uh, we're still in a, what we call a Goldilocks environment of fairly low interest rates uh, relative to inflation. So we, people are going to keep buying what they consider to be inflation hedges, and the stock market's a great inflation hedge. 
Okay, now let's talk about uh, net earnings revisions. Um, what happens is, is when analysts are revising their estimates higher, uh, we have positive revisions. And, um, and then the markets usually go higher. So we've had positive revisions for several quarters. Now, the third quarter is not quite as strong as it was in the previous few quarters, but it doesn't matter. It's still historically very high. So we're going to count uh, our average stock has very positive analyst earnings revisions in recent months, and that usually precedes big earnings surprises. Okay, now here are the analyst earnings revisions by sector, and you might uh, expect here that energy uh, has had massive revisions because of higher uh, crude oil and natural gas prices. And I want you to know that's pretty odd. Usually in the fall, the weather cools, and um, what happens is energy falls. But what happened is Europe had very good weather. They had a big high pressure system sitting over Europe, kind of made, stopped their windmills from working. So um, uh, spot gas prices went nuts and, um, and they really haven't built their gas reserves for the winter. So in some countries, the gas prices are gonna be up six fold over last year. So uh, <clears throat> we have that, we have <coughs> strong demand for crude uh, oil even though OPEC's boosted production. Um, the biggest problem we've got in America is our output is down and uh, a lot of oil companies don't want to invest because the Biden administration said fossil fuels are going to be transitory and they're going to be phased out over time. Well, obviously they're going to be around for a long time, but the average energy stock is just paying back its shareholders in dividends and earnings and reluctant to invest because they don't want to invest when they're hostile. A good example is uh, uh, New Mexico is part of the Permian Basin, and but all the, 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 the drilling in the Permian Basin in New Mexico is on federal land. So when they had that federal drilling ban, they stopped drilling. And that federal drilling ban was overturned by a federal judge, but the Energy Department remains very hostile. So um, nobody's drilling, even though the judge overturned the Biden administration's drilling ban. In the meantime, uh, the state of New Mexico wonder what happened to all their tax revenue, you know, because it funds their schools and stuff. So I personally find that very amusing, but uh, very sad. Um, in the meantime, you can see that a lot of other sectors have had positive revisions. So that's good. Okay, and here's just another way to look at uh, earnings revisions uh, today versus at the end of September. And you can see that by and large, for the, at least the first three sectors, analysts have raised their revisions just compared to where they were at the end of September. So we're only like 20 days into October, but they're still revising their estimates higher before earnings come out. So that's a very positive sign. So industrials, consumer discretionary and energy, uh, if history repeats, should have the biggest surprises. Now, this is a very interesting chart. This is the S&P calendar year. And um, you can see that this year we're forecasted to have very, very strong earnings over last year. But 2022 isn't looking bad either. So, um, you know, we're growing. And, um, but I do expect the market a little bit more narrow, a little bit more selective. Okay, there are some headwinds out there. So let's talk about them. The CPI. Uh, most of the inflation is in food and energy. Now, some of the food inflation comes from high fertilizer prices. You, you may know that they use natural gas for fertilizer. So guess what happens when natural gas prices go up? Food costs go up because fertilizer costs go up. So that's a big problem. And then, of course, we have uh, uh, energy prices are up to begin with. So the good news is a lot of the inflation seems to be contained in food and energy. And if we can control food and energy prices, because the U.S. is a very big country, um, um, you know, we, we can probably start to knock down inflation. Now, the Fed is expecting inflation to cool next year, but right now we're running at a 5.4% annual pace, uh, what they call the core PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, is running uh, about 4.4, last I looked. Uh, the producer price index is running eight six, uh, so there's there's some issues. So we're far off from inflation cooling, but uh, you know this is going to be the Fed's main mission is to get uh, to real in inflation. Now, just so you know, the Fed has two mandates: one is unemployment, 
and one is inflation. And they basically threw inflation aside to deal with get to fix the unemployment issue. And although there's over 5 million jobs that haven't come back since the pandemic, we are in a full employment economy. There's lots of evidence of that. Even today, we had very low new claims for unemployment. So I think what's happening is the Fed is about to give up on its inflation mandate, excuse me, it's a, a unemployment mandate and focus more on its inflation mandate. And uh, hopefully they'll be able to reel this in a bit. In the meantime, uh, I want you to know the stock market's a great inflation hedge, okay? The main thing though, is we got to keep inflation under 5% because if inflation gets above 10%, the stock market fizzles. If inflation is between five and 10%, the stock market still is a good hedge, but we really got to get inflation under 5% and then it'll be a, a much better hedge. Okay, let's talk about this current market environment. This is a fascinating chart I'm showing you. This is the S&P 500 in the first half of 2021. And we take the S&P and we slice it into 10 slivers. So we sliced it by share price, market cap, uh, the percent relative to its moving averages, uh, P ratios, price to sales, price to book, high dividends, uh, uh, dividend yields, short interest, analyst ratings, uh, international revenues, and uh, what it did uh, last year. And what you see is we've had a largely a big short covering rally. Okay, the stocks that did the worst last year are now doing the best. Um, um, what, what's essentially happening, a lot of people will tell you, well, it's a value rally, okay? And therefore, uh, uh, growth is out, value is in. Well, you know, it, you know, in some cases it is. It's, it's a, it's a uh, steel stocks are rallying, aluminum stocks are rallying. I have copper stocks, I have lumber stocks. I have companies profiting from the inflation out there, okay? But, you know, to me, those are growth stocks as long as they have earnings, okay? So... We can't just break into value and growth. Right now, our needs are coming out. It's every stock for itself, okay? But I do want you to know you've been in a bit of a washing machine and there hasn't been a very clear trend and that's been confusing to many investors. Okay, here's something that's not confusing. These are interest rates. And what happened is when our Fed uh, at their last FOMC, Federal Market Committee meeting, basically implied they would raise rates next year, they sent short to intermediate rates soaring. So a year ago, our rates were in yellow. A month ago, they were in red. A week ago, they were in blue. And now they're in green. And you see the big bulge in uh, intermediate um, interest rates? That means the Fed's going to increase rates. Okay, period. So uh, the good news is it, rates are far below inflation. Okay. But the Fed will definitely be increasing rates next year. Okay, let's talk about how we uh, look at the stock market. Now, we have a very interesting process. We look for stocks that kind of zig when the market zags, and we have a dynamic stock selection model, and we're always looking for stocks that move opposite of the market. And we take our, our the, the stocks return on correlated the market, divided by volatility. That's our top secret ratio. And um, we will sell perfectly good stocks, okay? Um, if they just get too volatile. And um, and uh, it's interesting, you know, it's uh, we also like fundamentally superior stocks, but we've been selling some very good stocks fundamentally just because we got better stocks to buy. Okay, now what we do is we figure out what works on Wall Street. And this is an example of one of our, our back tests. And uh, we back test growth and corporate governance and momentum and liquidity. And anyway, when we do a test, we want to find something that decays in an orderly manner. And so the, the factors on the left are working. The factors on the right are not working. Okay. And we start to score our stocks. So we're very proud of this. We're what is called a fundamental quant, where we stack the odds in our favor based on what's working on Wall Street. And this is an example of how we start to evaluate factors. Back to our, our quantitative ratio, we look for stocks that move independent of the market. That's called an alpha. We divide the alpha by the stock's volatility. Alpha divided by volatility is our top secret reward risk ratio. I pioneered this, I wrote a book on this. We give this away free in the public domain through our dividend and stock graders. We are very proud of this. 
And the reason we're so proud of it is you can see how well it works. We are showing you uh, the stocks at rank A in our quantitative system, which are the ones with the highest alpha over standard deviation. They're in blue, Bs are in red. And then we have Cs, Ds, and Fs. Now, one thing about me, I, I need to let you know, I am registered with the SEC and the SEC prohibits us from showing you gross numbers. So we've knocked down these chart numbers by 3% a year, okay? And even with that haircut, okay, to comply with the SEC, um, we are still beating the S&P, the A's and B's are still beaten. So uh, I do apologize, we can't show you gross returns, um, but um, our models are still very, very impressive. Then we do our fundamental analysis. We want to identify what's working on Wall Street. And then we test. And we test lots of growth and value criteria, over 140 variables. And we weight them on a trailing one and three year basis. Uh, we test them on a one and three year basis. And if they work, we'll, we'll weight them on how they worked in the past year. So certain factors can be weight, uh, weighted more than others. And here's how the testing works. The chart on the left is a good test. It shows you how performance decays as a factor decays. Let's just assume that's earnings momentum. The chart on the right is not a good test. We call that garbage in, garbage out. We don't have a good pattern. So what we do is when we do our, our fundamental testing, we're looking for anomalies, inefficiencies on the market we can capitalize on. And that would be the charts on the, on, the, on the left. Now I can tell you cash flow is working very good now as is margin expansion, as is analyst revisions and sales growth. Those are some of our best variables at this time. Anyway, here's our eight factor try and true fundamental model and it's stunning. You can see the stocks at rank A are in blue. The stocks at rank B are in red. Uh, the ones in C, even with the 3% haircut are kind of in sync with the S&P. And then we have the Ds and Fs. So we are immensely proud of our fundamental models, okay? And so we want a high quant score, which is alpha over standard deviation and a high fundamental score. And this allows us to go into earnings season locked and loaded every quarter. And then we count on those earnings to drop kick and drive our stocks higher. And when we blend our models together, here's the combined model for picking stocks. The A's are the, um, the ones that are strong buys, B's are buys, C's are holds, D's are dogs, and F's the dog with fleas. These charts are knocked down 3% on every single category. So uh, we're trying to comply with the SEC and uh, they don't like us to show you gross returns. So we're showing you minus 3%. But uh, obviously we can do a little bit better than this in real life. Okay. Um, so when you go to our website, you can uh, go to our portfolio grader and you can key in any stock and we will grade your stocks for you. And they could be A, B, C, D, or F. And not only do we give you a total stock grade, we give you our quantitative grade, an overall fundamental grade, and then the grades versus our eight tried and true fundamental variables, which are sales growth, margin expansion, earning stability, earnings revisions from the analyst community, earning surprises, earnings momentum, return on equity, and cash flow. Those are our, our, our tried and true variables. So our research is online available for you free. And not only can you go to our website, which is www.navler.com, you can also save portfolios on our website and visit them weekly. Our databases are updated weekly. All right, we want to talk to you about dividend stocks because they're hot. They're hotter than hot right now. So here we go. The reason dividend stocks are hot is because treasury yields stink, okay? We happen to be showing you the 10-year treasury yield in red and the S&P 500's dividend yield. And guess what? The S&P 500's dividend yield, as of when I did this chart, is actually three basis points ahead of the 10-year treasury yield. I think it's changed just, it's changed a bit in the last few weeks. But, you know, dividends are taxed at a max federal rate of 20%. And of course, interest income is taxed at a max federal rate of 37%. But if you're above a quarter million interest income, they throw an extra 3.8% on, so it'd be 40.8. So um, because dividends are literally taxed at almost half the rate of interest, dividends look pretty good to most people. These are the qualified dividends. REITs and things like that, you have to pay um, ordinary income tax rates. 
But the good news is dividends do grow. And we've noted they're growing over 6%. And we have real nominal dividends here. But we, um, we have a dividend growth portfolio called Power Dividend. And what, uh, what we do is we uh, track um, uh, how stocks are, um, are, um, are, are, are falling under our system, but we can get you a 3.4% yield with stocks that double their dividends every six, seven years. And we think a dividend growth portfolio is your best substitute for income right now. And we're very proud of it. It's a very safe portfolio. By the way, here's our dividend grader, which is online free to you too. We rank stocks A, B, C, D, and F. And the stocks that go in the dividend growth portfolio are predominantly the A-rated ones. And again, we like stocks that only have pay you a nice dividend yield, but double their dividends every six to seven years. And here's some examples of some great dividend growth stocks. Arbor Realty Trust, now this is a REIT, uh, yields almost 7%. Ally Financial, which is not a REIT. Big Five Sporting Goods, now the reason they were doing so good is they sell a lot of guns, okay? If you look at most of the sporting goods companies, they sell lots of guns. Buckle, a good retailer. Citizens Community Bank, Dick's Sporting Goods, again, lots of gun sales, okay? Don't worry. They also sell golf clubs and things like that, but I just want you to know that's fueling their growth. Escalade, which is a consumer recreation company. Evercore, which is an investment bank, a, a guaranteed bank shares, and Harry Furniture. These are all examples of great dividend growth stocks. All right, we also like conservative growth stocks. So let me get to and show you some here. On Wall Street, they like to tell you that you need to mix growth with value. And we have a value chart there in red and a growth chart in, excuse me, a value chart in blue and a growth chart in red. And the two do move opposite of each other. But we prefer to mix the growth stocks with the dividend growth stocks. And we think you'll get much superior performance because if you look at the value chart in blue, even though it's done a little better recently, it unfortunately has not done well for, uh, unfortunately, over uh, 17 years, okay? So we really, really do uh, want you to do uh, growth uh, conservative growth and dividend growth. And here's an example of our stock grader where we combine all our factors to, to pick the stocks for you. Again, these charts are knocked down 3% a year to comply with the SEC. And here's some of the stocks that rank the highest. Arbor Realty Trust, which also passes uh, very good in our dividend uh, growth portfolios. American uh, Financial Group, Extra Storage Space, uh, Hartford Financial, Interpublic Group, it's advertising, Oasis Midstream Partners. These are all examples of very strong A-rated stocks. We have Old Republic, Robert Half, Star Bulk, uh, helping with all the uh, supply shortages out there, Automated Data Processing, ADP, and, and finally, American um, Financial. I'd like to answer a lot of questions I get from folks. So I just want to back up here and uh, uh, answer some questions. So the biggest fear out there now is inflation. And everybody wants to know what in the hell are we gonna do? Well, you're gonna buy growth stocks. Growth stocks are a great inflation hedge, period. Um, you know, Procter & Gamble came out with record earnings uh, and they guess what they're doing? They're raising prices and or shrinking their packages so they make more per product. Um, so, um, that's going to be happening everywhere. So if you want to protect your portfolio against inflation, you got to go to the companies that are raising their prices. It's as simple as that. Now, I know you can buy more real estate and a lot of us have a lot of real estate and real estate's been doing very good, especially residential real estate, but uh, that bubble might start to get pricked a little because if you look at median home prices, they're not appreciating quite as fast as they have been uh, when you look at September year over year versus August year over year. Now, just so you know, as of August, they were growing at 15.2%. And as of September, they're growing at 13.3%. Those are existing home sales. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Um, as long as interest rates are low, I think housing is going to do very good. 
for all those of you in California, you, you know you've been rezoned. Uh, single family homes are essentially now banned. Suburbia has been banned in California. You can now put 10 homes on any single family lot. I'm sure a lot of cities are gonna fight this, but eventually California is gonna have higher density. Uh, this is one thing Governor Newsom did after the uh, recall. And um, so um, the good news is your dirt's worth more, your lot's worth a lot more, which might have to smash your house, put 10 units on it. So we'll see how, what, how municipalities fight this, but eventually we do expect like most hilltops in suburbia to be nothing but multifamily homes. And that's how it is in a lot of, a lot of other countries. You see the, the, the view, the, the ridge the, is always uh, uh, apartments and then down below you have single family homes. So um, stocks are gonna be a fine inflation hedge. The other thing that's going on, we get questions on is China. What in the hell is going on? Well, Evergrande defaulted on US dollar denominated debt. They, uh, they're not defaulting as much on their yuan denominated debt. So they're basically telling the foreign investors about the US dollar denominated debt to go booger off. There's another real estate company in China that's also blowing up. The Chinese middle class love to buy real estate. The reason there's 65 million unoccupied apartments uh, and condos in China is the middle class bottom is investments. But now that bubble's been pricked. China's talking about putting property taxes on real estate, and there's a big pushback. But the bottom line is China is it is now teetering on a recession. Officially, they said they grew at 4.9% in the third quarter, but their purchasing manager indices in the in September were negative for both manufacturing and services. So China's in trouble. They're also having COVID problems. You may know the Russia's having COVID problems um, and that's messing things up. The final thing is China has, has been having rolling blackouts. Electricity prices are fixed, coal prices are up. So a lot of the utilities don't wanna sell their electricity at a loss. So guess what they did? They, they, um, they uh, just shut off the, the power plants and they had blackouts. So it's kind of hard to run a country when you have rolling blackouts. So when you look around the world, uh, Asia's, Asia's struggling, okay? And, um, and Europe's struggling and they're gonna have, their energy prices are much higher per capita than they are in America. And, uh, and our energy prices are going up. So what's going on is we look better than the rest of the world at this moment. We have higher rates. We do have a stronger economy. Uh, what really makes America great is we have 50 states. And if one state screws up, you can just pack up and move to another state, which Tesla did, Hewlett Packard did. Uh, you know, a lot of people have moved to Florida, you know, Tennessee, Texas. So the good news is if you don't like it, you can change it. And that's unique to America. And that mean, that's why no matter who we elect, okay, we can grow and prosper. Okay, um, so the question is, when is the Fed gonna raise rates? Well, they're gonna raise rates at least a quarter percent next year. And they promised up to another two or three uh, rate increases uh, in the following year. But here's the deal. The Fed can't raise rates too much because of the interest then destroys the government. Right now, the interest on our debt, which is over 29 trillion, is more than our Defense Department budget. So we are starting to hit the point of no return. Now, it looks like we're not gonna get a tax increase because Christine Sinema, the Arizona Senator, is refusing a tax increase. So she's really pissed off the Biden administration and they're starting to do some nasty articles on her. But she's holding firm, Joe Manson's been holding firm. So it looks like nothing's going through and there's not gonna be a tax increase, which is wonderful. And it looks like there'll be a big shift in the midterms next year. We'll have more balanced government, which what most Americans want. But the main thing I want you to know is that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the Fed can't raise rates too much. Now, if our government taxed all of us at 100%, we'd still have an $88 trillion deficit. So they can't tax their way out of their conundrum. The only reason they'd raise taxes is to punish somebody they didn't vote for them or you know, uh, just for their social programs and, and uh, things like that. But you know, the government gives us a lot of money through social security and stuff, and we know how to spend money better than they do. 
And the government's becoming increasingly a big transfer payment program. So even though we might not have the most pro-business administration now, we're, we're still going to prosper. And, um, and we'll see what happens. Okay. But longer term, uh, it's still very scary for a lot of people. But longer term, uh, the U.S. is an oasis. You can look around the world, and we just look better than everybody else. Uh, we deal with immigration better than everybody else. I know the immigration is a very uh, sore subject, but we we uh, have a lot of uh, people on our temporary work visas, and um, uh, we're a very generous country, and obviously we have a lot of illegal uh, workers now, um, and hopefully they'll fall in the system and pay taxes and all that good stuff, because when they don't, that the, they are a drain on our society. But in the United States, we are younger than Europe. We're younger than Japan. China's getting old. Young societies grow and prosper. And if you need to have any proof of that, just go to Utah. Utah is the fastest growing state in America. So I feel very good. I think we're, the next four months are going to be great. I think the market will get more narrow, more selective. I use my dividend stock raters to pick the creme la creme for you guys. I hope you learned a lot. And uh, please go to navalier.com, use our stock and dividend graders. And one last thing, we have free market commentary on navalier.com. Sign up for it. It's called Market Mail. And uh, you should get a pop-up when you log on, and then uh, we'll sign you up. So with that said, it's Louis Navalier. It's been an honor to talk to you folks. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much, Mr. Navalier. We really appreciate your insights and all your information. And I want to thank the attendees for joining us today and wish everybody a good day. Bye now.